attending River Ridge and River Ridge Kids. I'm excited to see you guys pretty soon, but today I'm going to finish up our last series on the Sermon of the Mount. And in this, Jesus is um, saying that people who hear his words and follow them are like the wise builders who built on the strong foundation of a rock. But those who ignored his words were like foolish builders who built their house on the, on the sand, which doesn't hold up in storms. Um, so the Sermon of the Mount, um, the last part of it is ending in Matthew 7, 24 through 29. So you guys can follow along with me or just um, listen to me. So I'm going to start with verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell. And it was a great fall. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he had taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So um, some kids or adults may build their life or their knowledge on a weak or sandy foundation. So that could look like um, things that celebrities say or do. They can build their foundation or ideas on that. Um, things that their friends do, information from clubs or groups that they're a part of, um, from people you see on TV or the news, or even older people or adults in your life who don't know God can, um, can give you ideas that will give you a bad foundation. Um, but Jesus is saying in this Bible passage, um, we know that um, our foundation from, is from God's holy word, the Bible. It doesn't change with culture. It's God breathed and absolutely true. When we turn to um, the Bible for direction and knowledge, we are building our foundation on it. And Jesus tells us that this is the best way to live on earth until, until we are with him in heaven. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit, a little demonstration on this. So this is a house built on a rock. Um, it's firm, it's not gonna fall down when winds come or trials and tribulations happen in our life in our lives so this rock is like God's word the Bible so instead of turning to the other things that I told told you about the worldly things we turn to God and his word for our truth and for our knowledge and foundation um, but when we build it on something soft and sandy ground um, like things that are easily changeable in our world or our society or culture right now um, it's not a firm foundation and it can easily found, fall down. Um, so Jesus is saying what, his foundation is God's holy word. So when we turn to him, we have a firm foundation and we can make it through these trials in our lives. Okay, I hope that demonstration was helpful. Um, I'm so excited to see you guys in a couple weeks and I pray that everybody's doing well and staying healthy. Good morning, River Ridge Church. So today is Sunday, July 12th. In two short weeks, we will be gathered right here in this building with our church coming together with Spring Grove Bible Fellowship to form one church. Uh, we're going to call it River Ridge Church Spring Grove Campus, and we're so excited to be able to anticipate that coming soon. But today we're here to lead you in the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, as always, we hope that you will be able to set aside any distractions you might have at home and jump in and participate in every way that you can as we together kind of go through a practice run of worshiping the Lord as a church family in preparation for what we're going to do in heaven with the Lord in our presence uh, for the rest of eternity. So I hope you'll feel the freedom to join in and let's worship the Lord together. God, I'm running for your heart, I'm running for your heart, till I am a soul on fire, Lord, I'm longing for your ways, I'm waiting for the day, when I am a soul on fire, till I am a soul Yeah. 
come with trumpet sound Oh may I there in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless and born before the throne Let's go to the Lord in prayer Father, we thank you for the great privilege that you have given us to be called your children, and that's what we are. Uh, your word says, many as received Jesus to those who believed in his name, you gave the right to become children of God. And we are so grateful that we are brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, that we have the opportunity to gather together to worship our Savior this morning and to do it with Christians all around the world as they too assemble together to be able to worship our, our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we just pray and thank you for your kindness and mercy and grace that you extended to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We know we didn't deserve our salvation. We haven't done anything, in fact, to earn it. We've just accepted it for what it is, a gift that you offer us and, uh, Lord, that we receive by faith. And so today, Lord, we praise you and honor you for that great gift, for our Lord who made it possible for us to have life abundant and eternal. And we come to you this, this morning, Lord, in his name. And we pray for our church. We want to be a church where people can meet Jesus, the Savior and Lord. And so we pray that as our two bodies come together to form one church family, that we will have the even in greater commitment to be able to take the gospel to our family, our friends, our neighbors, the people who live around us, uh, Lord, that we might be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ and help people to meet you personally and have a relationship with you. We pray that we will be faithful to the Great Commission to make disciples of Christ, that people would grow in the relationship with him and learn what it means to follow him wholeheartedly. Lord, we pray that we would have a mindset to reach this whole world with the gospel and that you would raise up from our fellowship young men and women who would receive a call to serve you in full-time Christian ministry abroad and here in this country. And for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that we would just be mindful of the fact that we are always your ambassadors, always seeking to be able to represent your kingdom well. Father, thanks for your goodness and your grace and mercy and Thank you so much for your provision in our lives. Uh, we have what we need and even more. You have provided abundantly, and we just thank you. And we pray that you would help us to be generous and kind with what you have given us and ready and willing to share with others as you lead. Lord, we're so grateful to be able to receive our offerings this morning that we use to support uh, the work of this church and the missions that we support. And so we pray that now... Lord, as we give, that we would give not under compulsion, for you love a cheerful giver, but that we would give sacrificially and secretly and worshipfully, and ultimately, Lord, because we love you and recognize that everything we have is yours to begin with. So we just set aside a portion to do your work in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to sing a song for you, Lord. Lord, for you, I want to sing a song. I want to lift my voice to heaven Listen to the angels sing along A song of your faithfulness A song of your grace And of your loving kindness To the glory of your name With everything that's in me, Lord Listen to me say I want to sing a song for you I want to sing song I want to live my life for you Lord Lord for you I want to live my life I want to praise the name of Jesus and pray above all things you should refine a song of your faithfulness a song of your praise
And I sing about your mercy And I sing about your love Your goodness, Lord, your righteousness I want to sing a song of your faithfulness A song of your grace And of your loving kindness To the glory of your name With everything that's in me, Lord Listen to me say I want to sing a song for you I want to sing song we'll sing holy 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 Can you believe it? It's now been 13 weeks in our preaching series, Practical Christian Ministry, a study of the book of James. Uh, last week, by way of review, we looked at James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, and what it means when we pray if the Lord wills. That's what James says we ought to pray. And it's a recognition of God's sovereignty over the earth. The word sovereign in the Bible means absolute ownership and uncontrolled power. And of course, God owns everything because the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including us. And he has uncontrolled power in the sense that none of us have the ability to control God. Uh, in some senses, we are controlled by him as we live under his reign and his rule. And so when it comes to our lives, we're not just to make plans without first considering that the Lord may in fact have another plan for us. And so we always are told to, to consider the fact that uh, when we make our plans, we will do them if, in fact, the Lord wills. Now, this morning, we're going to consider some very strong words in the very next part of, this, uh, of the letter of James, in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, that come in the form of first a condemnation and then four charges that were leveled at those who uh, were wealthy and uh, probably wealthy landowners and who were acquiring boatloads of money by robbing their employees of their wages. And these wealthy people would hire men who would work in their fields from dawn until dusk, and they were supposed to be paid at the end of the day, and it was kind of the system that was worked out so that the poorer people could be able to buy what they needed for food and supplies for their family for the next 24-hour period. But sadly, many wealthy landowners were coming up with excuses for withholding these men's pay, and then they were pocketing it for themselves. And in doing so, they were contributing to the starvation, not only of the men, but of their families. And clearly, James is not happy about it. Now, before we get to our text, however, we need to stop and address uh, the thought that since we, most of us, do not consider ourselves wealthy, this passage has nothing really to say to any of us. Uh, we all know that wealth is a relative term. Most most people tend to think of uh, the rich as those who have more than we do. And of course, this would include people like Jeff uh, Bezos and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and the other 537 billionaires in America today. Um, and I'm sure that none of us would say, not argue that, that they're wealthy. We would recognize that they are. But the question for us is this. 
not how do we stack up to these gentlemen, but how do we stack up in terms of income when we're compared to the rest of the people of the world? Uh, I know it comes as no surprise to you to hear that if you as a family make $60,000 a year, you are in the upper 0.2% of everyone in the world in terms of annual income. Uh, if you were to drop that figure down from 60,000 to 20,000, you would still be in the top 4% around the world. Not long ago, the Gallup organization did a survey and discovered that 34% of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day, and another 22% live on less than $1.25 per day. To put it in perspective, more than one half of the world survives on less money per day than we could expect to spend on a large bottle of water at a convenience store. So when it comes to God speaking to the wealthy, we, we have to consider that he may well be speaking to us as well as those who are billionaires and millionaires. Now, I'm not saying this to heap guilt upon you, but simply to make you aware that no matter what your annual income is, your name and my name will appear on the global rich list. Uh, this means that the words that James wrote to wealthy landowners about their love of money and uh, over anyone or anything else certainly has some application for us as well. And so let's start this morning by looking at our text in chapter 5, verse 1, where the apostle condemns the wealthy for their mistreatment of the poor. So here's what he says in verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Uh, this is a pretty harsh rebuke of the wealthy people uh, in the day, in the time when James was writing this letter, who were oppressing the poor, uh, especially Christians. And it kind of has the tone of one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, maybe someone like Isaiah, who in chapter 13, verse 6 says, Wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. And James uses a similar tone when he speaks to these wealthy people people because he wants them to understand that he's not talking about earthly temporal suffering like they might have a financial setback or suffer from some kind of illness but he's talking about eternal punishment that will come from God to them on the day of judgment about this the writer of Proverbs says wealth is worthless on the day of wrath it isn't going to help anyone now these words were meant to put fear into these wealthy landowners in much the same way that Jesus' words were in Luke chapter 6, where he said, Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and reap. Rather than laughing and celebrating at how they were able to manipulate the system to keep the money that was owed to their workers, the unrighteous rich to whom James is writing should have been weeping and wailing because of what they discovered was coming to them, the holy and terrible wrath of God. Now, what exactly were they guilty of? Well, James gives four charges against these rich people, starting in verse 2. It says that they were hoarding their wealth. Here's how James says it. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and the corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. These men were plainly doing what Jesus had said not to do in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, why would Jesus say a thing like this? Because he knows, and we need to as well, that things are not going to last. They, they are not eternal. The Bible says the world is passing away, and so are all the things in the world. They are guaranteed to disappear with time. The idea that the person with the most stuff wins, which a lot of people ascribe to, is absolutely not true. There is no lasting benefit to them. And so James warns that these things that they had acquired that were now corroding and, and 
becoming moth-eaten and rotting, will actually bear witness against them. That's what the phrase, will be evidence against you, means. That when God judges them, perhaps he will show them all the stuff that they had acquired and hoarded to themselves and not share with anyone else. And instead of that being credited to them as something good, it will be justifying his condemnation of them. And so he says, first, they, they hoarded their wealth. Secondly, they defrauded the poor. So in verse 4, he says it like this. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. They're now crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. I mentioned this already, but the idea is, is that these wealthy landowners were were probably coming up with all kinds of excuses as to why they couldn't pay the workers at the end of the day. Maybe they said stuff like this. I'm sorry, but I, I anticipated getting some money today that didn't come in, and so I'm going to have to wait until tomorrow to pay you. And then the next day would come, and it would be followed with another lie. Oh, you know what? My foreman's sick today, and he's the one who, who hands out the money. And then each day there would be another excuse until finally the wealthy landowners would just dig in their heels, look at these laborers and say, don't push me or you'll never get your money. They, they had power. They, they had influence. They could manipulate the system and protect themselves from prosecution, which sounds like a lot of wealthy people today. And so what were the poor laborers to do? They, they had no recourse except to hope that eventually they would be paid for their work, which they had already performed. Now, James wanted the wealthy to know that someone was listening to their pleas, and it is the Lord of hosts. It means the Lord of the armies of heaven. And he heard every plea, every prayer for justice. And of course, he's very good at keeping score when it comes to these kind of things and making sure that the unrighteous get what they deserve. And then he gives a third charge in verse 5. They indulged their own selfish desires. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. If you've read the Old Testament, you may remember that this is one of the sins of the people who lived in Sodom as well. Uh, do you remember that story from the Old Testament where God destroyed them with fire and brimstone because it says the outcry against them was so great and their sin so grievous? What, what were they guilty of? Well, certainly a part of their offense was sexual perversion, men being with men and women with women. But another part was the charge against the wealthy of being overfed and unconcerned for the poor and the needy. If you've read that story, you know it didn't end well for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the people to whom James is writing now, these wealthy landowners, if they knew of that story, should have considered their fate and wondered if it would come to them as well. James says they were getting fat on their greed but they failed to recognize that a day of slaughter was approaching where there would be a kind of a reversal of fortunes. And like cattle being fattened for the kill, they too were going to be facing eternal death. And then the fourth one is this. They murdered innocent people. Verse 6. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Uh, the righteous person here is the typical Christian who is experiencing persecution at the hands of the wicked rich. Now, in this case, because they did not receive the wages that they had, in fact, earned, some of these people were literally starving to death, and not only them, but their families. And, of course, they were helpless to do anything about it. They didn't have bank accounts. They couldn't take out loans, and so they just did without food. James says this is murder in the same way that striking a person and causing his or her death is. It, it may take a little while longer, and because of that, in some ways, it's, it's perhaps even more ruthless. You, you may have heard about the eight-year-old girl, Sequoia Turner, who was shot this past weekend while riding a car with her, in a car with her mother and her mother's friend, and it was, took place in Atlanta. 
The shooting happened not far from the Wendy's on University Avenue, where Rayshard Brooks was shot and killed last month. Investigators said the little girl was in the backseat of a Jeep Cherokee when the driver tried to get around one of those makeshift roadblocks that was manned by numerous armed individuals. And that's when a man walked up to the vehicle, fired several shots into the car, and killed the little girl. At a news conference Sunday, the mother said that her daughter died in her arms. She said she was only eight years old. We, we understand the frustration of Rayshard Brooks, but we didn't have anything to do with that. We're innocent. My baby didn't mean no harm. What that man did was heinous. It was despicable. And I like to think that there's a special place in hell for people who would do that. But the truth is, these wealthy landowners were no less heinous and despicable because of what they were doing to the men who worked for them and to their families. They were starving them to death so that they too were cold-blooded killers. Why? What was their reason? Because they didn't want to part with their money. So James gives them four charges. He says, you have hoarded your wealth, defrauded the poor, you've indulged your own uh, desires, and you've murdered the innocent. Now, what does this have to do with us today? Well, let me say that uh, as some of the rich in this world, we are in danger of doing the same things if we do not keep a biblical perspective when it comes to our wealth. And so I'd just like to share four thoughts with you about why God blesses us with wealth. Here's the first one. Wealth is given to make us humble, but it can make us arrogant. Humble because we know that God has given us everything that we have. That's what scriptures say. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and exalts. But proud because we have a tendency to credit ourselves with acquiring it. And then as if that isn't enough, we, we put it on display to stir envy in others who wish they had it. So wealth should make us humble, but it can make us arrogant. A second thought you need to remember is wealth should make us generous, but it can make us cruel. Generous because God blesses us with an abundance so we can bless others. 2 Corinthians 9, 11. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. So wealth should make us generous, but it sometimes makes us cruel. Cruel when we ignore those in need because we really just don't care about them. Thirdly, wealth should make us responsible, but it can make us self-indulgent. Responsible because we know to whom much is given, much is required. There is a stewardship of things and that we are called to use them for God's purposes in this world. However, self-indulgent when we choose to ignore God's word and to use them just to make our lives a little more pleasant, a little easier. And then one more. Wealth should make us compassionate, but it can make us ruthless. Compassionate when we share with others because, quite frankly, we recognize it's simply the most loving thing to do, and ruthless when we're willing to harm others just so that we can keep our wealth or gain theirs. Humble, generous, responsible, compassionate, or arrogant, cruel, self-indulgent, ruthless. Which will it be? The former words describe the spirit-filled and eternally focused believer who lives his life to glorify God and bless others. The latter, the barren person who, out of a love for money, which is the root of all kinds of evils, will do anything to anybody just to get more of it. Failing to heed the warning of our Lord in Mark 8 when he says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and for, yet forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If you think about it, is there anything more valuable to a man than his soul? Evidently, James knew of some people who thought there was. And today we know of some people who uh, also 
give in to grave temptations because they believe that there is something more important than the human soul. And that is how much stuff, how much money they get out of life, even if it's to be gained because they steal it and because they murder other people. About 10 years ago, I read a book called Public Enemies, America's Greatest Crime Wave and the Birth of the FBI from 1933 to 34. It detailed the brief careers of several gangsters, some of whom I'm sure you have heard of, people like Machine Gun Kelly, John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, the Ma Barker gang, and a known associate of her gang, a man named Alvin Karpus. These notorious people robbed and they murdered their way to other people's money. It was for me a fascinating read about human nature. And I remember when I was done, I put the book down and I started to reflect on the stories that I had read. And three things stood out to me. First, the brevity of their careers in crime. Most began and ended in only two or three years. Secondly, the fact that they were seldom able to spend the money they stole because they were always hiding out from law enforcement. So they would move from one hideout to another, hoping that uh, they could avoid the law. And third, the fear and foreboding that was their constant companion as they waited for the law to catch up with them. Interestingly enough, the only one of them who did not die a violent death at the hands of the authorities was Alvin Karpus. He spent many years at Alcatraz, was finally paroled in 1969 from prison, deported to Canada, and died of natural causes 10 years later. Each of these people forfeited their souls for the simple reason that they loved money and they wanted more and more and more of it. I doubt if any of us will ever resort to a life of crime like these people did to get more money. But I, I want to warn you. If we love money, we are still in danger of finding ourselves in the same place at the end of our lives as these people were and even the wealthy landowners. Alone, scared, and with the knowledge that in the not-too-distant future, we will face the judgment of God. James says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Sure, he was talking to wealthy landowners, but he's also talking to us. And we have to heed the warning, make sure that we reflect with the stuff that God gives us, his kindness, his generosity, his love, his compassion for people. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. And we want very much to live in light of eternity, to live in light of your plan for us, recognizing that you bless us with things and money so that we can be a blessing to others and show your love to them in, in real ways that make a difference. Please help us not to love money. You say... Uh, in your word, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, and we know it is. And we don't want to be those people. And we acknowledge that, comparatively speaking, certainly we're, we're some of the rich in this world. But we want to be kind, and we want to be generous with others just as you are with us. So please teach us how to do that, Lord, and help us to be faithful to your calling. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for joining us today for worship. Uh, we hope you were blessed as you sang with us and we exalted Christ as you sat under the teaching of his word from James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And now I'd like to give you the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord.